Hello, everybody, and welcome to another starstruck installment of Club Moffat Talks. I am your host, Chris, instruction librarian. I'm Joseph. I'm also an instruction librarian. I'm Allison. I'm the marketing and outreach coordinator here. And joining us today is Tiffany Ziegler. Would you like to introduce yourself and what you do here? Sure. Uh, my name is Dr. Tiffany Ziegler. I am currently the interim dean of the Dr. Billy Doris Makeda Graduate School. Um, I'm also an associate professor in history. Nice. Sorry, I had my uh, my notes buried under a pile of things. It's very nice to have you on today, Tiffany. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with our podcast, at this point, we uh, we kind of like to go around and talk about just what we've been up to lately. I'm going to go last because I'm going to complain about things. So uh, whoever wants to go first, feel free. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> we, we, we did just successfully uh, watch the eclipse with these glasses that you can't see because of my filter. Um, the, uh, yeah, I, I had not expected for it to be such a communal event. I thought it was just going to be a thing that happens and, and that it's like, oh, that's going on. But, uh, there was a lot of activity here on campus, different departments, different, uh, organizations specifically having get togethers just to watch the eclipse. Um, and I, I think that part of the reason I didn't think it was going to be such a big deal is because I knew we weren't going to get the the total visual uh, from 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 our location. But uh, yeah, that was it was actually kind of fun going outside and staring up in the sky with 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 everybody. <laughs> um, aside from that, uh, my wife and I are currently reading the second book in Wheel of Time, uh, The Great Hunt, uh, and we're enjoying that. We're a few more than a dozen chapters into it now uh we're doing the chapter a night and uh i've i've been finding some weird odd tv series that are completely finished uh and in the course of just a week or two i watched all three seasons of a show called louder milk uh which i really enjoyed um it's about a really terrible man he's a really terrible man he's very broken and he runs a like counseling group for recovering addicts um and the way that he's just mean and horrible to everyone deeply amused me which probably says disturbing things about me uh but i think that's that's pretty much for for me uh tiffany or allison what about you um i'll go uh for me i i think last time we recorded I said that I was watching the Yellowstone show mm -hmm. um and I finished that and then I finished all the spin-offs to it like the uh the 1800 one and the 1900 one I really liked it it was kind of different than stuff I usually watch but it was very entertaining and I just I do love a show that's like a good drama with all a bunch of moving parts and all this other stuff happening which is part of why now the show that I'm watching that I've never seen before because I was too young, I'm now watching The Sopranos. Mm -hmm. So now I'm on, I'm like halfway through season five and it's definitely a very interesting show. And I know I can tell why it's been talked about for so long and why people, you know, say it's like classic TV and it's all, and it's like a huge hit for HBO and it changed HBO and things it's very good I like it and it's kind of like how you were just saying Joe about like a character where it's like about a bad bad man mm -hmm. but like it's so entertaining because that's what the Sopranos is it's like a bunch of terrible people like terrible doing terrible things but they're so interesting and entertaining and crazy the thing they don't prepare you for when you start watching the Sopranos is that it's the funniest show that's ever been filmed uh <laughs> And you go in thinking it's going to be a crime drama, and then you get to stuff like, uh, oh, God, Chrissy got really high and killed a dog and uh, whatever. Like, it's this horrible drug intervention scene, and it's the funniest thing that's ever been on TV. It's yeah. like, it's a real, like, it's a, a really dark, uh, like, serious intervention. And the things that they talk about are so hilariously funny that it's like, you forget what you're watching for a minute 
Yeah, it's definitely, it wasn't what I was expecting. And like, even um, all I really knew about the show was that it was about like the mafia, like about mob bosses. That's pretty much the entirety of what I knew about the show. So in the very first episode, when it starts with Tony, the main character, and he's like the big mafia mob boss, and he's in therapy, I was not expecting that at all. And it's such like, it's a huge plot to the show it's like a huge point of his character and all of that stuff and I wasn't expecting that at all and I think it's very interesting and it speaks a lot to why the show is so good for them to do like right off the bat already having something like that already shows that it's different um but yeah I'm enjoying that uh, for reading I've been into some graphic novels or comics it's called the it's called saga oh um I have wanted to read it for a long time, like back in 2015 or something was when I first heard about it from people online. And I've had the first volume since like 2015 when I heard about it, but I just recently read it in uh, March and I've read the first two and I'm enjoying that. I think those are fun and it's a very cool story. It's like very weird, but again, entertaining and different, which is cool. Then, like, movie-wise, I saw Dune 2, and I really, really liked it. I think the Dune movies are so cool. Very nice to have, like, this new franchise. But that's pretty much what I've been up to. That's uh, a perfect segue, because uh, I was going to spiel about about Dune. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I was really excited. Uh, I, I have two little children, so I don't get to go see films very often. So mm -hmm. I finally got to see Dune 2 a couple of weeks ago. And um, I, I have opinions, but I'll keep those to myself for those who who haven't seen it but uh like like any good uh, nerd i was like i've got to go back and i've got to read and so uh i've been listening to the dune series i'm on the fifth heretics of dune right now and uh yeah it's it's been an emotional emotional ride let me tell you so uh i i normally listen to it after or yeah after the kids are in bed and uh, uh and then right before i go to bed and so yeah leads to some fun dreams <laughs> <clears throat> what's the how does the first movie start dreams or messages from the deep yeah yeah god yeah i i would i i'm excited i can't wait to watch dune 2 i i got to see the first one in theaters and like you i also have two very tiny children and phew, yeah, i'm missing a lot of stuff right now i, I have a, a four month old and a two year old with and some change um so no movies actually my my mom took a picture of of me uh uh going to the mall uh with with her and my oldest and um i walked by the psych center like the the theater listing or whatever and i just saw there this was when godzilla minus one had just come out and i just I put my hand on the screen and i was like japan sent me a christmas gift and then my wife gave me one early, and I'm just like, mm, I guess it, I guess the other one's okay, but really wanted to see Godzilla minus one in theaters, and I really want to see Dune two in theaters. So, I hope it was good. <laughs> I, like I said, I've got opinions. I don't know where we're going to go after this uh, with some of the the plot lines that have changed a little, but we'll see. Yeah, I found that out when. The way the movie ends, the second movie, apparently it deviates from the books. And I think that that is interesting. And it's cool when adaptations do that because then it like kind of gives fans, you know, of book of the books and things. It puts it keeps them on their toes. The best example I can think of is um, Twilight Breaking Dawn Part Two. When I was in high school, I read it, and in the second movie they completely the end of the movie they completely changed it from the books and then like everyone in theaters was like screaming like oh my gosh and no and everything but then they kind of revealed the in twilight they revealed that it's like this vision so but i think it's interesting when the creators do that directors you know changing things up yeah i said that about uh one piece the, the Netflix one piece where it was like, there are things that like all the story arcs are there, but they're just really different. And I really appreciated seeing a new light on that. So I, I totally agree. 
<clears throat> what else you got going on, Tiffany? Um, a lot and nothing at the same time. <laughs> so because I, I'm immersed in research all the time, I unfortunately spend more of my free time doing uh, scholarly reading. So uh, I picked up some old Flemish lately. <laughs> I've been reading some 14th century charters in Old Blemish, so um, I will not bore anyone with that. <clears throat> well, speaking of boring people, is anyone ready for me to complain for a few minutes? Because I got some stuff going on that I'm not happy about. Um, so I came to late. I came to work late today because yesterday I bought a new part for my computer, and I was so excited. I was so happy and excited to get this new this new part to make my computer not be terrible anymore. And um, a simple like 15 minute process ended up taking about four hours because I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Um, my, my kids are out of town. My wife's out of town. They're doing this this eclipse thing um, in East Texas because it's they got a better view of it, I guess. And um, I've just totally lost the plot. I, I, if I don't have structure in my life, I'm just like, I'm a mess. So um, I'm like, okay, well, this time I got this new computer part in, I'm going to install it. And um, yeah, so way, way drawn out experience, turn my computer on, and it just the screen just doesn't come on. It just says that eh, nope. Nah, all the lights and all the stupid LEDs and stuff are coming on and no display. And I'm, I'm just immediately like, I've got a homework due in just a few days. <laughs> I got a, um, what, what do you mean? No display. So, um, yeah. So I worked on that for like another four hours. Um, and just, just nothing. I tried everything that I could. So about eight o'clock, I just said, you know what? I'm going back to bed. This is this is terrible. I'm 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 so miserable right now. So I woke up today and um the guy who's gonna fix my computer was uh he's out in Dallas looking at the eclipse. Uh so I'm just like, okay, well he he ran me through like all the steps I could have taken, you know, whatever. He he did what he could. But I'm just I'm just like, okay. All I want to do is complain about how stupid this stuff has become because I did everything right. I hate computers. Um, I didn't get to watch the last episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm yet either, so that's annoying me. Uh, since my wife's out of town, we we love that show. Uh, her favorite show is Seinfeld, so Curb is like Seinfeld too. So I'm not going to watch it without her. Um, I don't think I did any a single thing else this last week. Um, as you can tell I'm full of nervous and anxious energy so uh, before I continue rambling just everyone know I, I'm really annoyed today I need I need all the energy I can get um, but that's it that's all for me I'm trying to think if there's any other like movies or something I watched I don't know if I mentioned that I watched Poor Things last time but movie's excellent um it's uh I I was telling people it's it's Frankenstein for perverts. So if you like either of those things, if you you know, if you like Frankenstein, if you want to see it an artsy movie for perverts like all artsy movies are anymore, help yourself. It's a good movie. Um Oh, I watched Resident Alien. Our last guest talked about that too. He, he was very um very enthusiastic about Resident Alien, and I, um, we we watched through all of that, and it's pretty good. I have no notes, no other opinions about it. It's just a pretty good show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think that'll just about do it for me. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Tiffany, because I believe you've got uh, some interesting topics that you wanted to bring up with us. Joe, did you have interesting topics to bring up, and you didn't mention it to me? I, I I just I, I think that that was a, a a soft like a like a like a, 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 a I'm not a sports guy but like a professional <laughs> sports person throwing the ball at like a little league kid and they're like what? <laughs> that was the that was the expression that I got from Tiffany yeah. and I was also diving out of the way so uh, so I mean maybe I'm misreading. Um, 
Okay, so Tiffany, you're in charge of the graduate program. <laughs> Can you tell us, it, it, it seems to me, because I was looking online, and it seems like we have a lot of different graduate programs, and it seems like we're trying to add more. Is, is that correct? Uh, yes and and yes, uh, I can yeah. answer that a little bit. So we have more than 20 actual programs uh, with various concentrations uh, housed in our, uh, well, five of our six academic colleges. Mm -hmm. So uh, the only one that does not have um, uh, graduate programs is Fane. Mm -hmm. And so we have them in Dillard and McCosme and Prothero Jaeger, um, Oh, which ones am I missing? I am also a nervous ball of energy and anxiety today, if you can't tell. Uh, um, yeah, but anyway, so we have them in those five, and uh, we also have a number of uh, concentrations that students can do um, in addition uh, or sort of uh, certifications. Uh, and then we also, um, uh, we are growing to some degree. Uh, we just added a, uh, a doctoral degree uh, in ed leadership. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's a lot. Uh, so, and not all the programs are the same. There are some programs that have uh, much, much bigger enrollment versus some of our others. So our MBA program, for example, is huge. Uh, our clinical mental health program is huge, uh, but then something like history is just a little smaller. Mm -hmm. okay. How many doctoral programs do we have on campus? Just, just, uh, just the one? Oh, okay. Interesting. Just the one. Okay. Just the one. So, and you know, there's, there's talk by various programs about expanding, um, but really our business is in the master's level programming. Uh, we will be adding a new master's of science and in industrial technology this fall. Um, so that's uh, being offered both online and hybrid uh, and in person as well, but um, a nice complement to engineering. I, I It seems like when he was a guest on a previous podcast that uh, Jeff Killian was talking about an interest in a, a doctoral program in radiology. Is that something that's still being looked at as a future possibility? I think so. I, there are a lot of things that are kind of on the hold or just, you know, we, we kind of push the brakes on because uh, a number of us have uh, had been or are still in an interim position. And so, you know, some decisions are better made by a permanent uh, position than interim. And so uh, that program was uh, kind of uh, envisioned, I believe, not only by Dr. Killian and Dr. Watts and Dr. Vele, uh, but also Dr. Johnston, who's no longer here. And so I think some of that initiative has kind of fallen off. And now as we rebuild um, with a new president and new provost, uh, we'll get there. So. So are there other, any other new initiatives since we have our new, um, we have new presidential and leadership and stuff. Is there any other kind of initiatives that maybe you could talk about or coming down the pipe? Yeah, I, I think program wise, uh, I'd like to, uh, I, I can't speak for, for them, of course, but um, you know, in, in a graduate school sense, a lot of it is about stability and growing the programs that we have. And so most of our initiative is our, you know, um, focused in on that growth uh, and, and helping those programs. Uh, we have, uh, you probably have heard that the, the psych program, uh, clinical psychology closed, or they're, they're due to close. They haven't closed yet, sorry. I hope I didn't scare anyone, uh, but they're <laughs> due to close in uh, the future. And because of that, we're shifting some resources over to clinical mental health. And I, I think that speaks to the um, kind of the desire of our graduate student population to have more online uh, degree programs as opposed to in-person. So clinical mental health is completely online versus psychology, which 
clinical psychology, you know, most of the time you're, you are in person. So uh, I think that's uh, one of the initiatives. That being said, there's, there's still some push for, for in-person uh, that we see every once in a while. And so I don't think we'll ever get away from about two thirds of our grad population being online versus the in-person. Mm -hmm. uh, but as for other initiatives, the, the, uh, Grad school, uh, I mean, we've been here for a year now <laughs> in Ferguson. I say here, I know we're virtual, but uh, <laughs> we're sitting in Ferguson right now. <laughs> we've been here, and I think uh, one of my initiatives was to really brand the grad school as not only a space, but a place for grad students. And so I've really tried to say, yeah, Ferguson's our home, uh, our physical home, and uh, we've tried to ramp up activities in our Graduate Student Resource Center. Uh, and so nice little plug for that. Uh, we provide coffee and, and chocolate, quiet place to study for our grad students. Uh, they can also, there's a big table, they can do conferencing, they can practice presentations. There's all sorts of video technology. Uh, the uh, uh, all our computers have uh, webcams so they can do lockdown um, monitor, um, uh, browser monitor. So, uh, yeah, I think that's that's helped a lot. And then uh, I would say kind of a final thing that we're really pushing is our social media presence. And we have a new recruitment specialist who, um, Janae Reed, she's great. Uh, who's been doing some of that, but we also have a, um, we've been hiring grad assistants uh, to do some social media. So um, playing with some digital marketing strategies. But uh, so to bring it back around, you know, wh what is the, the president and the provost, you know, what are their initiatives? It's always to grow enrollment and to keep it steady. So I think that's, that's kind of the, the backbone of it all. I think it's cool to, Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I think it's cool to have a space there for the students um, in Ferguson, like for the graduate students, because there's a lot of different places on campus for students to gather or study or do things, but it's nice for the graduate students to kind of have something for them to go to and like to have all the stuff set up. And I think how you were talking about like trying to push that and like seeing students there using that, I think it's good and fosters community and you know, all of that. So that's very cool. Yeah. I mean, graduate students are interesting because they're, they're about a fifth of the population of well, around a thousand. Um, so I guess that's closer to a sixth, sorry, historian, not mathematician. <laughs> uh, and it's a big number, but again, about two thirds are online. And so, you know, you figure about 300 students at any given time really need a place that's their own. And so I'm all about creating that identity, um, that place for them. And it's it's been neat to watch it grow this last year. As I'm sitting in my office, I can hear people come in and out the door more and more frequently. So I know it's being used. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's nice to see that identity. I, I really appreciate the idea of a um, somewhere being a space or like capital P place. Like that's something that we hear with libraries all the time. The library mm -hmm. is a place, which means that it's, you know, it could just be, you know, you come here to get your books or your research items or whatever, but it's also here just for you to be and just to exist. If you need to study or if you need to meet with people or whatever else it's here for basically everyone on campus but to hear that there's a place also for graduates that's designed for graduate program um I, I don't know if I'm speaking for everyone but I know that um my graduate program has been uh, horribly stressful so to have a place on campus that you could go to belong and everyone else is kind of in the same boat as you I think that's extremely important yeah and also just recognizing that we we are an institution that grant grants graduate degrees and you know graduate students go through like you were saying Chris uh, very stressful um, times and recognizing that they're an important part of the campus uh, I think our our focus is so much on undergrads that we lose sight of that and so I think uh, one of the one of the other things that I've been working on is the um, the uh, uh, Kind of recognition of graduate students, especially at graduation and the time surrounding graduation. 
Uh, so uh, graduate students work very hard and have very stressful programs and tend to do pretty well in their programs. So uh, why don't they get honors courts or why can't they be recognized for mm -hmm. four point ups? Because that's pretty you know impressive if you can do that at the grad level. So we've um, instituted that. And then next uh, academic year, the honors banquet, where we we typically see only the, the awards for graduate man and woman of the year, mm -hmm. that's going to be expanded. And there will be graduates um, from every college, um, as well as um, finalists from every program. So those 20 some programs uh, will have 20 some students who will be recognized as opposed to just, uh, I believe it's six this year. So, Wow, that's great. And it's like you said, it's not like anyone, like no one excludes graduate students, but it does happen that, you know, because we focus so much on undergrad at MSU and it's such a big part of like a majority of, you know, the degrees and all of that. So it happens sometimes that even if no one means to exclude it, it can sometimes, you know, people fall through the cracks or people forget and things like that. So it's important to put recognition on the students and to let people know like they're here and they're doing the hard work and they're a huge part of this campus and community and you know making sure that they get recognized for what they're doing and just you know trying to make it a bigger moment for the graduate students. You know and that's uh, the return of uh, commencement to campus has been such an amazing thing for our grad students because it separates them out and gives them their own event where they really get to be celebrated. Uh, I, I will never forget the story of my dad. So I did my master's degree at Texas Tech. And uh, for some reason, uh, that that degree, the the undergrads and the masters were, were together. And this guy in front of him was grousing about the fact that he had to watch all the hoodings of the master's students. And he's like, oh, you know, and so I guess my dad just tore into him. He's like, you know, one of those idiots you're waiting for, you know, to get their hood is my daughter. And <laughs> I, I feel like, you know, it allows with that separation, the undergrads to have their celebration, it allows the grads to have their celebration. And uh, it's just, it's a neat kind of atmosphere. And you know, we're constantly changing and improving. And one of the things that I'm really excited about for commencement um, here is that the uh, last year it was the SGA president who spoke at the grad commencement, which felt a little odd that the undergrad, you know, president, I mean, great, great speaker, but uh, we have a grad student speaking. And um, near and dear to my heart, she was one of my advisees in history as an undergrad. And so I've watched her grow. And so I'm pretty excited about that. That's awesome. Do you see a lot of students who come directly from their undergrad degree and then move into graduate? Or do you see, uh, I, I guess I'm asking, like, are, are there more uh, coming back for their degrees or more just going straight from undergrad to graduate? It, it really depends on the degree and kind of the student population. So, um, Take, for example, uh, our degrees in education where you have um, certified teachers um, who've been in the field and now, you know, they've worked for a couple of years. Now they're ready to get that master's degree, maybe special education with a dyslexia training or, you know, they want to add this certification like principal certification. And so I think they um, that's a kind of a later add a lot of times, not necessarily right after uh, some of your other programs, the MBA is really popular for going right from undergrad into the grad. Uh, so it really just depends. But we honestly have everybody from, you know, 20 year olds, you know, if they go really fast. So maybe 22 year olds <laughs> all the way up to, you know, we had 60 and 70 year olds uh, in our, our program. So uh, it just it just depends. That's great. Uh, Tiffany, I'm, I'm not sure that you can necessarily answer this question, but it's because you specifically stated this, I, I, I wonder, uh, what is the reason that we don't have any kind of graduate program in, in the FANG area? Okay. So 
I brace myself and <laughs> make sure I'm not going to say anything silly, but uh, I'm going to, I just don't think that option has been explored yet. Um, a lot of times when we look at graduate programs, though, um, we're looking at the cost, uh, not only in like actual um, money amount, but uh, personnel. And so graduate programs are expensive to run uh, because you're typically going to have fewer students in the classroom. Uh, so it's a much smaller ratio. Our, this is a bizarre ratio, but bear with me. We have a 17 to 5 ratio of students to teachers. And so, yeah, it's a bizarre one. But that's uh, it's, it's a very small ratio uh, when you think about professors to students. And uh, if you have a program like um, geoscience or history that has a thesis, that means a lot more uh, time is going to have to be given to evaluating those theses, doing the research with the students. And so it's just really honestly costly uh, for grad programs. And uh, the other kind of piece of this is, uh, and because it's floating around faculty, so I don't, I don't, I'm not too hesitant to talk about it, but faculty workload. Uh, those who teach graduate courses have a reduction in teaching load. And so that puts an onus on the department or the program to find somebody else to fill that role for undergrad. And so a lot of times we have to be careful that we don't cannibalize our undergrad program to create a grad program. And so that's where the biggest issue is. I, you know, I've, I've joked with Dr. or with Leah Ghost uh, time, you know, and time again, like, hey, when are we going to get that sixth college added on here? Uh, but, you know, I just don't know if the resources are are there. But otherwise, historically, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, no, I mean, that's, that's, that's fair, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it feels like we've been kind of grilling you for the better part of a half hour. Are there any questions that you have for us just, just so we can maybe kind of back off and breathe a little bit? Mm -hmm. So one question that I had, and, and you'll maybe you'll you'll hate me or you'll love me for it, but uh, I was going to use this as a moment to uh, really uh, get our grad students to the library. <laughs> Not that I should have to, but if you wouldn't mind talking about what resources are available uh, for graduate students uh, as a nice little plug. Joe, you want to go first? <laughs> See, I was, I, I was about to just throw that at you, Chris. But <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, for graduate students in particular, I mean, the things that they need to worry about are going to be the online databases and scholarly peer-reviewed resources. Um, we try to have fun little nights here like Allison's been really great about getting our uh our uh what, what do you call the dog nights <laughs> sorry uh, therapy, dogs. therapy dogs that's it uh, we try to have fun events like that as well but the, the bulk of what we focus on is how can we get these materials that are useful or necessary for graduate students to have access to how do we make that easier for them to get access to uh, a big thing that we've been really pushing lately is contacting professors directly and just saying like hey we like uh, I, I won't say exactly which programs they are but we're seeing a lot of students who are like hey my professor just kind of told us that the library exists and what they're you know that you can we can go there and talk about what we need and I just have no idea where to even start so we have a bunch of one-on-one -on -one sessions now with uh just any student really it, it really graduate undergrad it doesn't matter just because the things that we tend to teach are things that we know as librarians that we've taken you know library school for um that honestly it's not like we expect anyone to just come in here and then be like I know how to you know, discover databases and do all this stuff. It's more along the lines of we we expect people to have questions. So that's what we are really prepared here to do. Um, the our, our classroom instruction, the big goal of that is that whenever people come in here and they have they have questions or whatever, it's because maybe we weren't able to cover that whenever we have our big class instructions, or maybe it's just something that they have really particular needs for their research and we need to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about that. So uh, for grad students, that's the big thing. And I believe we had a, 
I may have put together a survey as well where we were asking like what can we really do for for grad students that we're maybe not aware of like because we like to have the same level of engagement and instruction with everyone but at the same time it, it's a difference between like uh several um several uh peer-reviewed resources as opposed to like one or two for an undergrad class so that's that's really what we tend to focus on something i would say is good too is our interlibrary loan services um because you know we have a lot here at moffat library lots of books lots of you know materials all kinds of things but we can't have everything but interlibrary loan services is an option where if we don't have something that a student's looking for, whether that's a book, an article, a DVD, a CD, they can request through it through interlibrary loan. And then what we do is we send out that request to other libraries and whoever has it will send it to us and then the student can use that. So I think that that could be really helpful for, you know, if someone's doing research and I think, you know, in graduate programs, depending on degree and stuff, sometimes you're getting into like really specific stuff or like, you know, how you're talking about um, people have like an emphasis in their degree and stuff. So sometimes you're looking at really specialized things and maybe we don't have like that specific article or that like very certain book that's needed. So I think ILL could kind of fill in the gap there for graduate students to get what they need. And it's also great too, because with doing articles on there, that usually is a little bit quicker than a book because we're shipping things through the mail. So a book might take like a week or more sometimes, but if you need an article, we can usually get that a little bit quicker to students. And, you know, we have a lot of databases, but again, unfortunately we can't cover everything. So that's why ILO is great to what we can't cover then hopefully they can request it through that and we can ask someone else and get it for them. Yeah, I, I'm looking at four ILLs sitting on my desk oh. right now. So mm. <laughs> uh, I'm going to throw my my history grad students under the, the bus, but uh, I had to remind them that we have this wonderful service of interlibrary loan. Uh, there'll be, especially when you're somebody like me and you're a medievalist, you do obscure things. And so you're, you're very dependent on interlibrary loan. So. We've started yeah. to really focus in on that recently with our just our general instruction. We we have to tell people like you need to know that this is here, and we we even say like it. Sometimes you'll be looking in a resource like like a Gale Academic um, One File, whatever it's called, um, and they'll have a an indicator that's like we don't have access to this in this database. Do you want to search for it through ILL? Do you want to request it? Do you want to see if the rest or like any other collection in the library might have access to this one because it is a, an issue where someone may actually just be looking in the one database for all of their research, which is fine every now and then, but it, it's not going to going to include the actual article that they need. So uh, we have all these different ways where we, where we really try to tell people like, even if we don't have it that you, so you can look at it immediately, we want you to know that there are options around here. So uh, ILL is is something that we're really, really focused on right now. They're like, I'll I'll teach however many classes a semester, you know, and, and I might have one class where most of the students have used it before and it'll be an upper level class and then go through a, a few um, lower level undergrad classes where no one's even heard of it. And it's really important where we're like, you need you need to know that this is here because like like I tell a lot of people, um, we don't just say you need to find uh, scholarly or peer reviewed resources because they're scholarly or peer reviewed or whatever, because they're like your teacher needs you to, you know, check off a box that, that you're doing whatever kind of research. It's because that research is reliable and you know that it's going to be filled with really good information that you need for your research. Um, so it, it really is just a matter of like, we, we're we really trying to to hammer home, like this is for your benefit. ILL is also for your benefit. The stuff that we have is here for you and it's to make you a better student and for you to be more knowledgeable in your field. And it's not just for, you need to have ILL because your professor wants you to. Your professor wants you to because it helps you. 
and it saves them money. I mean, it it <laughs> drives me nuts when they tell me, oh, you sent me this link to this JSTOR article, but I couldn't access it because, you know, I have a, a separate subscription and I'm like, ILL it. Even if yeah. we're not that tier um, of that subscription for JSTOR, you should be able to still ILL it. So if you have the name of the article, the author and everything else, like even if, oh. if you just have that, like the, the citation or the abstract or whatever is still going to have all the information you need. So mm -hmm. like if your professor is giving you that information, you have everything you need to, to interlibrary loan it. Just go ahead and do that. Yeah. And we also do, we've started doing like DVDs and stuff as well. So if you're doing research in a class, where maybe you need to watch a documentary or just a regular, you know, any type of movie or something that's on a DVD. And then the li Moffat library doesn't have that. You can request that through ILO now as well. And, you know, again, hopefully we would find some other library that had it and is willing to send it to us. But now that there there's more options and we're doing it for CDs too. So I know we don't have like a music, thing but you know there might be another reason or use that you might need a cd and you can do that through ill as well you do this just to have fun with it you don't need to like also yeah. <laughs> just just as an aside yeah. this, this is yeah. something you just do for whatever reason yeah you could definitely like say you go to look at the wichita falls public library and they don't have a book they also have an ill program so you could do it there but you could also do it here if you're like, oh, I just want this book to read in my free time for fun, or I just want this movie to watch for fun. It doesn't always have to be academic. It can be for leisure as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I, I tell all of my instruction classes all of that about ILL. I tell them that they should be using ILL if they're not, because if you are connected to the campus, if you are a current student, staff, or faculty, you have access to ILL and you don't have to pay for it, which is amazing. Uh, because even if you can go onto a streaming service and see something, the library is free. You don't have to pay that $8 to Hulu or Disney or whatever to get stuff through the library. Um, and free is just almost always the best price for something. <laughs> yeah. Um I did want to point out one other thing uh, with our online resources is that we don't just have articles we have streaming movies we have an entire database that's just like theater um like like high quality recorded plays from like the whatever the british theater uh royal institution is company? what is it royal shakespeare company oh uh, yeah something like that um uh, <laughs> but no we have a bunch of different uh online articles and resources like that that are just specifically for like whatever program you have it's not just going to entirely be like uh mla peer-reviewed like critical essay or whatever we have these uh extraordinary medical um uh, databases as well that are just full of like <laughs> not not to uh, sound dumb about it but like graphs and uh different types of research and like images that you may need for for that like we have a lot of stuff that's um just that people don't really know about i think just because it's like unless we're telling you about it you're not going to really know because it's at our institution so yeah, yeah like just about anything if it's going to help you with your research we, we can either get it for you or we already have it not to, to totally go on a tangent but i think one of the best kept secrets that shouldn't be a secret is uh special collections oh yeah, yeah. It I, shouldn't be, no but <laughs> you know i yeah, I, I know I'm a, a graduate, well, interim graduate dean, but, you know, I still teach the the first um, half of the world survey, you know, a 1000 level course. And there is nothing I love more than taking uh, students over there to see the, the cuneiform um, seals. Oh, I, yeah. It's just, and they're like, wait, is this really, you know, a couple thousand years old? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's wonderful. I think yeah, the one that we collection. all end up showing is the uh, the leaf from the uh, Gutenberg Bible, because mm -hmm. because I have to explain like what a leaf is and like the, you don't know I don't I can't really explain to you how valuable this one piece of paper is. That's one that I always go over. I'm like, look at this thing. It's it's pretty cool, huh? The uh, yeah, I, we used that leaf when I did the Reformation uh, 500, but yeah, but yeah, the the. 
copy a photocopy of some of the charters I've been working with. Oh. And yeah, I get to play with them. It's so much fun. <laughs> that's that's, awesome. that's incredible. <clears throat> But yeah, that was actually, I, I want to bring this back up again. I don't know if I probably talked about it on the on this podcast before, but uh, when I was interviewing here, um, when we got done with the interview, um, my current boss, Ryan, was like, okay, well, previous podcast host, Ryan, uh, was like, okay, well, you want to come over and check out our special collections? And I said, yeah, sure, that sounds, that sounds like fun. Uh, and and um, he took me around, he showed me everything about it. And at the very end, he said, so even if we end up not hiring you, um at least when you you drove out here and you didn't get to see or you got to see something cool and i was like <laughs> it was cool but thanks for the the uh the encouragement the it was really cool though I, I came away i was really impressed with it yeah. yeah even before you enter the special collections room just that we have like an original printing press like outside of it and we also have another um, one on the second floor too, the other on the other side. Just even before you even walk in, you're looking at this amazing thing that it's like they we don't have those anymore. So it's very cool. And then we also do where you can do tours of the rare books room and you can go in there and our special collections librarian, she can take you through and show you all kinds of things. And you can you can't obviously check anything out from special collections because, you know, we have to keep everything pristine and all of that, but you can still use it for research. You can go up there, you can look at the stuff, you can read over the things and you can still use that for research, you know, for what you're doing. You can, you can get your hands on it, but you have to like, you have to make an appointment for it. It's a very, I don't want to say it's exclusive because one of the, the, um, qualifiers of us, of us even having that was that people can use it whenever they want but still like you have to really go through a process to to get your hands on that it it, it is really nice to use that for research but yeah it's like it's another one of those like very um open secrets almost but yeah that's one of those things we're so proud to show that off uh but it's not even just what we have there those are all the really cool visual things that you can see right away like look here's the uh, an original newspaper from uh, the Titanic sinking. Here's a second print of uh, a newspaper that was um, um, it was displaying the the play that Lincoln went to when he was assassinated. It's something something Sun. I, I can't remember the name of it offhand, but uh, uh, the second printing of that newspaper had Lincoln's name attached to the flyer saying president lincoln's going to be in attendance just so that it had this like that they could sell more copies of the second printing because it had that historical um uh addition to it and that's the one that we have a copy of but then we have just boxes and boxes of of uh records and other really important archival material that um i believe our um archival librarian has either fully digitized or is working on finishing up fully digitizing that and it's been a long process but it's such a it's such an amazing uh valuable asset that we have at our library so if you haven't if you haven't seen it yet please check it out it's it's incredible it's uh it's it's one of our proudest achievements yeah, on the topic of digitizing, something that might be a good resource for graduate students as well is we recently digitized all of our theses. Uh, we went through and all of the ones that we had, you know, physical copies for, you can now find all of that online on our website. So, you know, if you don't have the opportunity to come over here, or you were saying a lot of the graduate students in the program, they're online, and you don't, you know, you can't make the time to come over here to the library, we have all of that available on our website now. So if you need to look at any of those or anything, all of that's available. Should I mention TASP? I feel like I feel like I would be remiss not to mention TASP, <laughs> but uh, I don't know what they have additionally to offer for graduate students, but they're a fantastic uh, group here. If, if you need any kind of tutoring help, no matter what level you are, please, yeah, feel free to come by. They're they're so happy to help. Their tutors are great. Uh, can't recommend them enough. Yeah, well, even yeah. if you just want extra eyes on a paper, you mm -hmm. just want someone oh, yeah. else to look over and give you edits, you know, yeah, just you another set of yeah. eyes. Yeah, we have a, a specialty, um, a, a person that we pay uh, separate who does just graduate writing, 
but we're always directing our grad students, hey, you're struggling in a stats course or you're struggling in this, go to TASP. Uh, and especially our online because they do have that, was it 23 hour, um, you know, kind of a day help uh, online. So yeah, we have a lot. <laughs> just, that's, <laughs> uh, just to say that we, and we're, it's kind of a, a passive thing we're, with us where it's like, if anyone needs help, just swing by Joe and I are here for, for reference and instruction, or um, we have our tech services people. If you have any questions about like, actually, if you have problems with your uh, account or whatever else, like we have a lot of people here that who are, our job is basically like just people coming in and out of our offices all day asking questions. And that's what we're here for. And, and particularly with uh, people in graduate programs, uh, sometimes they're not available to come and see us when we're here eight to five, but uh, call us, send us an email, and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Um, yeah, there's, there's, you don't have to necessarily be in the building physically in order to interact with us. And also, uh, a librarian is almost always in the building uh, over the weekend on Saturday and Sunday, not necessarily an instruction but librarian, but there's people here that are here to help you. That's what everyone in the library is for, is to, to help the MSU community. Absolutely. Well, I know uh, I don't want to go too long over time. I know you've got somewhere to be and we all kind of have stuff <laughs> that are that's going on today. But um, yeah, if there was there anything else you wanted to add before we kind of start signing off? Oh. Uh just uh, a plug uh, for an event that's coming up, if you don't mind. Uh, we have our celebration of scholarship happening on the 17th and 18th of April. Uh, that involves not just grad students, but undergrad students as well. Uh, but on the 17th of April in particular, um, there'll be a um, uh, several graduate students presenting their research uh, in the Clark Student Center. Uh, either in a podium format, uh, you know, reading a paper or talking through one, poster presentations. Uh, I don't think we have any grad students doing creative activities, but we also have a few of them doing what's called the three-minute thesis, where they have to pitch their, their thesis in three minutes and they only have one slide to do so. Uh, so there's a a prize for that. So we have a, I think $500 for the first prize, first place and 250 for the second place. So a um, little plug for that. And, and of course, you know, there's the undergrad side as well. And then faculty are presenting um, as, as part of it. So just a great celebration of scholarship. I guess that's why it's called celebration of scholarship. <laughs> so uh, is that in the atrium area? So the, um, it'll be in you'll kind of see everybody mulling around, <clears throat> excuse me, that area, but it will be in Cheyenne, Kiowa, and Comanche suites. So uh, I think the posters are in Comanche, and then the sessions will be in Kiowa. Uh, and then there's some other stuff that's going on. There's a research presentation that happens at 3.30 on Wednesday. Uh, there's a security and safety and research. I think that's happening on Thursday. So uh, if you check out the MSU website, there's a, a link for it right when you come on. So that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, and on the topic of things happening in uh, the very near future, uh, Joe, do you want to tell us about some things going on in the community in the near future? Yes, absolutely. Uh, one thing that I want to continue to plug is just the existence of our Mustang studio which is an audio podcast recording studio that is housed here in Moffett Library on our first floor. And that is available to any current student, staff, or faculty. Uh, uh, do you mind if I say something real quick? Sure. Um, I just want to point out, I, I think every day I've seen at least one group of people doing training for that thing. It's it's so amazing to be able to go by there and see people actually like interacting with it and like working on it. Like I, I saw a group of like five people the other day actually recording something and I can't believe it's it's gotten so popular so quickly, and we just changed a little bit of the um, the sound. So, if you wanted to talk about that, any, but I, I wasn't. But but it's true. We have updated the sound tiles in that room, so it looks better and sounds better now than it did when it opened in January. Um, yes, that that's all true. Uh, in addition to that. Uh, the Department of Music is presenting a wind ensemble and orchestra concert 
on Tuesday, April 16th in Aiken Auditorium. Uh, you can get ready for a sensory delight at the 16th annual Cajun Fest, uh, downtown Wichita Falls, Saturday, April 20th. Uh, Department of Music is presenting a piano studio recital on Tuesday, April 23rd, again in Aiken. Uh, the speakers and issues will present artists Isadora Stowe and Manuela Gomez on Thursday, April 25th. Uh, that program is Sight and Insight, Unpacking the Philosophical Insights of Visual Rhetoric. Uh, MSU Texas Theater is presenting The Pirates of Penzance, which I love. Uh, and that is Thursday through Saturday, April 25th uh, through the 28th. Uh, MSU Texas is partnering with community organizations to host a pre-flight festival and market uh, Friday, April 26th on the MSU Ta Texas campus uh, in the quad. Pre-flight festival and market is a community kickoff for the Guardians of Freedom Air Show weekend at Shepard Air Force Base. Uh, Wichita Falls Museum of Art is hosting a paper making workshop uh, Thursday, or late April 11th and Saturday, April 27th. Uh, Moffitt Library will have the Therapy Dogs back one last time before the summer break, uh, Tuesday, April 30th, and Wednesday, May 1st. Uh, the next After Hours Art Walk will be downtown in Wichita Falls on May 2nd. And one more Aiken Auditorium thing from the Department of Music on May 7th. They're going to be doing a voice studio recital. Uh, if you want to know any more information about the things that I have mentioned, or other things that are going on on campus or around the community, please check out the events section of the MSU Texas homepage or go to the calendar at uh, discoverwichitafalls.com slash events. All right, Dr. Ziegler, thank you so much for coming on and speaking with us. And I know for a fact we'll, we'll be in touch with you very shortly. No clue what for, but I know we're, we're going to talk about something at some point. So, um, Again, uh, thank you for coming on, and everyone, thank you for listening, and from all of us here at the library, uh, see you again next time.